Thank you, Brother Kilpatrick, for your invitation to this pulpit. A long time I wanted to come here, but the, the Holy Spirit did not give me permission to come. But this time, the Holy Spirit commanded me to come to deliver his message. And uh, I've come here to deliver not only God's message, but personally, I wanted to be soaked by the Holy Spirit here. <laughs> so I have that tremendous desire to receive the blessing of God here. 1961, all of those years in Korea, we've been praying for the revival in America because I always felt that we were greatly indebted to America. When the communists invaded Korea, then America sent soldiers to deliver us from the communistic attack. And 50,000 American young people died in Korea to protect Korea from the communism. So I always felt indebted deeply to pray for America. And I asked all of my Christians to pray for America every day, especially Sunday and Friday all night prayer meeting. And in 1961, early part of 1961, I had meeting in Mobile, Alabama. And I was so burdened down in my spirit for America. I said, Father, are you going to give up America? I plead with you. But for America, there would be no Christianity existing in the whole world. America is the bulwark against the atheism around the world. Then suddenly the Holy Spirit came into my soul. And Spirit said, don't worry. I'm going to send great revival to America. Then the Holy Spirit said, this time I'm going to, going to send my revival through this Bible belt in the su southern part of America and this Pensacola area. So I was greatly encouraged. But I'm always afraid of prophecy. <laughs> So, I was very careful. Through my ministry of 40 years, I've been always asking God to give me the gift of the healing. In our prayer mountain, when I go into prayer grotto, I always ask God to give me the gift of healing. I never asked for the gift of prophecy. <laughs> because I saw so many false prophecy through my ministry. But whenever I prayed for the gift of the healing, God would prophesy through me. So I said, Father, I don't need this. I don't like to have the gift of prophecy. Give me the gift of healing. But uh, God is a sovereign God, and he decided what he wanted to do. And he always gave me the prophecy. And uh, I went to the Seattle, Washington to preach at the Brother Casey Treat Church. Again, I was in hotel and I was praying and praying, praying for the America. Suddenly, in my vision, I saw the map of America. And I rose up in my vision and I pointed my finger on Pensacola. Pensacola is such a small town that I did not know too well. And God asked me to declare the revival wind to start to blow from Pensacola. So I said, who am I? This is, this is foolish. Why should I stand up in hotel room and command the revival to come in Pensacola? <laughs> I felt very foolish. But God said, didn't I ask Ezekiel to command the Holy Spirit to come into the dead bone? He said, you command. 
So I commanded the Holy Spirit to come to Pensacola. And then I announced that prophecy to the congregation, trembling. I was so scared and frightened. Then it was 1961, but nothing happened in 1961, nothing happened in 1962, nothing happened in 1963. And now here people began to write back to me, as, are you real prophets? You prophesied a great revival in Pensacola, but nothing happened yet there. Are you sure that you gave a right kind of prophecy? And I really repented. I said, oh God, I should not have given that prophecy. I said, God, you did not show me the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy. So I'm afraid if I were going to become a false prophet. But when I heard the great sound of wind from Pensacola, I was relieved in my heart. Well, I started my ministry in 1958. We started preaching at the server of Seoul City with my mother-in-law, late sister Choi Ja Sil. She was a great prayer warrior. In 1959, Dr. John Hurston and his family joined with us together. So we started to pioneer work there. Those days, Korea was very poor after the war. Whole society was in chaos. And people were objectively poverty stricken. But we put up the tent and we began to preach. And those days, I prayed very much. I prayed but five hours every day. Not because I was spiritual, but I had nothing to do. <laughs> I had only five person, only five person in my congregation. And I had a great desire in my heart. I said, Lord, if you would only give me 300 person to my church, I will never complain till I die. <laughs> my vision was very small. I could not think of beyond the 300 members. But strange thing was that whenever I knelt down and prayed, suddenly in my spirit I see 3,000 people in my congregation. And I shook my head and I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I said, this is impossible. This is totally impossible thing. I don't even have 30 person, but here I see constantly 3,000. So when I open my eyes, I see old 10 church with five person. But when I close my eyes, I see 3,000 people in my mind. <laughs> the spirit in, impressed in my heart with the number of 3,000, day in, day out. And so naturally, by and by, I was completely brainwashed by that vision. <laughs> and I was pregnant with 3,000 people. And soon, I began to act as if I were a pastor of 3,000. I began to work with dignity like this. <laughs> and I was speaking as if I was speaking to 3,000 and these five person would put finger into their ears and say, Pastor, <laughs> don't shout. You have only five person. You hurt our hearing. But I would say, no, I'm speaking to the 3,000 people. And they all laughed. They thought that I was joking, but I was serious. 
because I was pregnant with 3,000 people. God put that vision in my soul, and I did not know that how that vision could be fulfilled. Then in 1959, Dr. John Hurston and his family joined. And 1961, Brother Hurston and I went out to the downtown of the city. He brought money from America. And we purchased the land and built a church. And by 1964, we had 3,000 people. In my own life, God always put his visions and dreams in my soul first. Then God gave me a great faith. First, I would receive visions and dreams from the Lord. Then I would pray with vision. I would never pray with empty mind. I would have a clear vision in my mind and I would pray with a vision. And then soon that vision would produce equivalent faith in my soul. In my life, it always worked like that. Church revival always started first in my heart. Then that appeared in my reality. So when I had 3,000, I was really satisfied then the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart. If you lift up your head and look to the north and the south, east and west, and see 6,000, I will give you 6,000. So I accepted. And I dreamed and I prayed. With vision I prayed. And after a little while, God gave me the faith. I believed. Then soon, we had 6,000. Then we had 10,000. I was very satisfied. One morning, <laughs> I came to church, and I laid down my uh, attache. I said, Lord, I'm satisfied. I have good church, good income, good home, wonderful family. And what man could desire any more than this? I'm satisfied. Then the Spirit says, you are finished here. Because you said that. He said, resign from this church. And go to another place. And build a church which sit with 10,000 people. And this time you should do alone. Dr. John Hurston will be gone. And your, your mother-in-law will leave you. You must do alone. I said, Lord, why do you ask me to pioneer three churches? I've already suffered enough, first the church and second church. And why do you ask me to go to third church? God said, I'm sovereign. Don't answer to me. Go. Then I had that vision in my heart. 10,000 people in my heart. But we had no finance. We had only $1,000 in our account. And to build a church seating 10,000 people, I need millions of dollars. So I discussed with my deacons and elders. And they sat down and they would not talk anything. They were afraid of the being levied with a heavy tax. And uh, some of the elders spoke up and said to me, Pastor, you are a young man. You don't know the economy of this world. This is no time to purchase land and build a church. Whole nation is suffering, and you can't get money. So after the committee, I began to pray. The Spirit said to me, when did I ask you to bring my decision through your committee? When I speak, you should obey. That's all. 
you should never, never discuss about my decision. Go ahead and build. So, I said, yes, I'll do that. And from that time, I kept this vision, and I prayed, and I was so frightened and scared, and I prayed and prayed and prayed. And one day, I had a great faith given in my soul. So, with the vision and faith, I went to the city, purchased the land, Yeido Island, a patch of the land with credit. Then I made a contract with a contractor to build a church without saving any money. And from that time on, I was living mostly in prayer. Because when I open my eyes, I see the reality. <laughs> I was shaken up. <laughs> and when I pray, I live in that vision. I see the hand of God. And then the war broke out. Yom Kippur war broke out in Israel. And oil shortage came. And our people began to lose job and bank closed the door. And the creditor came upon my neck. And I was sitting the rock bottom. I was struggling. And I was in a terrible situation. Then all of my Christians began to gather together, underground of the unfinished church. And we had prayer meeting. Every night. We would gather together, and we were pouring our heart, and we were praying. And I was praying to God too, desperately. But in my mind, humanly speaking, there was no way for me to get millions of dollars in this situation. I knew that I would have bankruptcy. And all the denominational churches and Christians were expecting that the Pentecostal church would have a bankruptcy. They were all my Job's friends. They would come and comfort me, but they were enjoying my bankruptcy. I'm sorry to say it this way, but they really did that. And newspaper began to attack me, and even my dear friends in our own denomination began to attack me. So I had no friend. But in very, very cold winter evening, about 2,000 people gathered together underground of that unfinished building. And we were praying, but we were desperate, and I felt hopeless. And then one very old woman came out, trembling. She was about 80 years old. She said, Pastor, would you please give me your microphone? I said, Sister, go down and sit there. Don't harass me. I have problem enough right now. <laughs> I thought that she was senile, so I said, you go and sit down there. But she was crying all over her face. She says, Pastor, just please give me a microphone for five minutes. I want to say something to the people. So to quiet her down, I gave her microphone. I said, only five minutes. She said, folks, we've been praying for God to answer, to finish this building. She said, I have no husband, no children. I'm living by the support of government. I've been saved under the ministry of Dr. Cho, and I have a tremendous hope of going to heaven. Soon I will go to heaven. And I'm coming out here every night praying for this church. But she said, just by praying, we are not reaching to any place. It's when Jesus Christ was in the wilderness. A boy brought five bread, two fish. And we must bring five breads and two fish to God. Then we should pray. Without sacrifice, our prayer means nothing, she said. Then she 
unwrapped something from very old yellow newspaper. And it was a banged up old brazen rice bowl and chopstick. She said, this is all what I have in the world. This rice bowl, I eat out of it every day, the chopstick. And I want to give this rice bowl and chopstick to the work of God. She said, I can eat food out of cardboard. Instead of using chopstick, I can use my gnarled finger. But she said, I have no money. This is all what I have. And I want to give this to the altar of God and pray. And she brought that old bend up brazen rice bowl to me. My heart was so broken. I was convicted. I said, because I started to build this church, I'm even robbing this old woman of the old rice bowl which she has. I was broken down. I was crying. I said, grandmother, I can't accept that from you. I'd rather die. I'd rather give up my ministry than exploiting you. No, I can't accept. She crumbled down. She was crying. She said, because I'm an old widow, because I give a very poor things to the Lord, you are not accepting me? And she was crying. Then suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon the congregation. All the people began to cry. All the people began to cry. The Spirit began to blow like a mighty wind. The Holy Spirit used her dedication. And then people began to stand up and they began to make pledge. People began to give their home, their whole year salary, and they began to give everything. And one night, we received more than one million dollars there. At those days, dollar was very strong, you know. I could not believe my eyes. Suddenly, the door of heaven was open. And people all began to dedicate. And I received money, and I completed the building. And in 1974, when I was having a dedication, Billy Graham came and he dedicated our church. And we had a minister seminar. Thousands of the interdenominational ministers came to our church. And every one of them praised the Lord. And they came to me and said, we knew that you could make it. <laughs> <laughs> but brothers and sisters, I tell you, when you have vision and faith, God intervened. In most of the difficult cases, in unbelieving way, God intervened. Then, after the dedication of the building, God said, if you can have visions and dreams of the 3,000, I will give you 3,000, uh, 30,000. So, now it's easy for me to have that kind of visions. So, I had that visions and dream in my heart, and I began to pray. I should pray till I have faith. Vision is vision. But when you become pregnant with vision, then you should pray till that turn into faith. And I prayed and I believed, and then our church grew to 30,000 and 50,000. Then I was traveling in Australia. I was having a meeting there, and I came to the Perth. Then they had an airplane stri strike. In Australia, when you go there, you should expect a strike at any time <laughs> because they're striking country. <laughs> <laughs> so I was stranded in Perth and I could not leave. I was in a beautiful Sheraton Hotel, but I was anxious to come out of that country. But every day, there were arguments between the labor and government and there were no plane leaving to Australia and I was desperate. And I was studying the Bible and I was praying. At that time, the Spirit said to me again, Joe, lift up your head. Look to the north and the south, east and the west. The land which you see, I will give you. 
I said, why don't you just give me that land right away? <laughs> the Lord spoke to my heart. Seeing comes ahead of possession. First you must see. Then you will possess. So if you could see 100,000 members in your church and believe, I will fulfill it. I said, Lord, I can handle 100,000 people. I can hardly handle the 30,000. I'm not well educated. I'm not able person. I can't handle 100,000 people. But God said, when you believe, you will have 100,000 people and you will handle 100,000 people. So, I believed. After one week, I came out of Australia and I came back home and I told the story to our people. I said, we are going to have 100,000 people. We should purchase more land, we should enlarge our church. Two elders stood up publicly and protested. He said, you are false prophets. You are exploiting the people. We can't go together with you. He said, we will fight to the last moment. You can't do that. But I said, I'm doing that because I'm servant of the Lord. Servant is supposed to obey the Lord. That's all. And the two persons was fighting me. They were going around discouraging people not to give money. But I believed. And we went on enlarging the church and purchasing more land. And before we complete the enlargement of our church, we had 100,000 members. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Then again, in prayer, God put the vision in my heart. If you can embrace half a million members, I will give you half a million members. I said, no way. I cannot handle half a million people. I said, Lord, don't you know that I am high school dropout? I have no college education. And I'm dumb here. So I cannot handle half a million people. But God said, my Holy Spirit can do that. You are not doing the work. The Holy Spirit in you will do that work. I'm just using as my vessel, point of contact. If you can embrace the vision of half a million, I will do it. I said, Father, why don't you choose a better person? God said, since you are poor, I use you. Talented people, they cal calculate too much. But since you are fool, you don't calculate. <laughs> it was shocking. God said, since you are dumb, I'm using you. So I said, okay, thank you. You are right. I don't know how to calculate. You know, I'm so dumb that I'm afraid of the computer. Whenever I see a computer, I'm scared. In my office, I have hundreds of computers, but I'm afraid of even touching the key because I'm scared. <laughs> so I ac accepted that God's project, I I was pregnant once again with that vision stream and in a few years we had half a million members and I took my wife to Japan I said let's have a vacation now <laughs> we have made it and we can't go beyond half a million and I said, I sacrifice you and the family. When you have a big church, you sacrifice your family. 
I had no time to go back home. Mostly I slept in my office. I worked for 24 hours. And so my wife and children were sacrificed. I, ha I have three boys and all of them left home. Now they are having wonderful family, wonderful boys. But when they were leaving home, they come to me and said, Pastor Cho, <laughs> we know you as a pastor, not as father. And that is the reason we don't like to become a pastor. We needed you in our juvenile time, but you were not in home. So we know you from pulpit, not in the home. That is still hurting my heart, but you can't help. If you really want to have a real growing, powerful church, your family should cooperate. And I'm so happy that my wife has been cooperating with me all these years. In other words, I would never have been used by God this way. So I said to her, now this, we have half a million members, and surely I tell you, I can handle any more than half a million people. So from now on, we will have a lot of time together. We will have a lot of travel. She will not answer. So I said, you know, I'm telling truth this time. But she says, since you got married, you have told me many a times like that. But you have never kept your promise. But I said, now is this real true? Half a million people. And uh, we can't expect anything more to happen. But she didn't answer. So next morning, we were having a family devotion together. I was praying together with her. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And again, he gave me prophecy, which I did not desire. <laughs> Even nowadays, I tell you, brethren, I'm afraid of prophesying. And I'm very careful. But when I pray, the prophecy comes. How can I do? The Spirit gave me the prophecy. And the prophecy came out. It's my son. You can have vacation when you come to heaven. <laughs> this is no place for you to plan for the vacation. You must work. He said, go back home, plan to have a one million members in your church. And I opened my mouth. I said, this is God's mistake. He can't entrust one million people to me. No way. And I said, dear, don't believe this prophecy. <laughs> but she said, okay, you go ahead and purchase more land, raise more money, build more church, and set up more satellite churches because I knew that you would never keep your promise. <laughs> so we packed them, came back home, and we began to enlarge our church again. Now, in my own church, under my direct ministry, we have 700,000 people. But I have studied uh, hundreds of satellite church. And when I send out my associate, usually I chop out uh, certain numbers of the cell system, least 3,000 to 5,000 people. I give three to 5,000 people with several millions of dollars. You go and start your work there. So I chop out my whole area. And by that way, I started hundreds of churches. And many of my satellite church has more than 100,000 members. So if I include them, we are far beyond a million members. But even right now, I have 20 satellite churches directly under me, and most of those churches have 5,000 to the 30,000 members. And sooner or later, I'm going to make those satellite churches all sovereign church, giving out to my associate. So, our church, God has started, and God has shown me how to manage our church through cell system. I train the lay Christian, especially lay women, 
Women are wonderful workers. You know, when I come to America and Europe, I always challenge pastors to use women. But American and Western ministers, they are afraid of using women. I don't know why. But women are wonderful workers for the Lord. Yeah. Out of 50,000 cell leaders, 47,000 of them are women. And I have 600 full-time workers, two-thirds of them are women ministers. Number one, women are very faithful and they don't compete with pastor. Well, so far in my ministry for 40 years, many of my men associate, without getting my permission, they split church away and they try to start their own church. But uh, I've never had any woman do that. They've been faithful to me. So it's very safe to use women. <laughs> and also, secondly, women are telewomen, women talk. Men will not talk too much, but women talk always. So I said, tell a woman, tell a woman. When you make a woman cell leader, they talk in beauty parlor, they talk in the marketplaces, they talk with uh, meetings in friends. They can't just talk about Jesus in our church. So through cell ministry, just purely through the cell ministry, every year we are harvesting more than 50,000 people. Since 1958 and until now, our church is uh, exactly like in the situation of Pensacola here. We have been having continual revival because God opened the door of heaven and God began to pour spirits in our church. And people come from all over Korea and from Seoul City to our church. Every day we have prayer meeting and we have, even nowadays, 13,000 to 20,000 people come together to pray. Every day, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Even last Wednesday, I conducted Wednesday prayer meeting, then I came out to the airport to come here. We had 20,000 people in 11 o'clock service during daytime. So we have great revival continually for 30 years. Brother Kil Patrick just before said that we don't know how long this revival will continue. I tell you, this will continue till Jesus comes. Not the Lord. Yeah. In Korea, we could embrace the revival by training the lay Christian. By training lay Christian and by making them the cell leader, they open their home around the city, around the country. And the cell leaders, they begin to gather together five to ten family, and they have their cell meeting. And as the cell grow more than ten family, then they have cell split, and they start another cell system. So by training the lay Christian and by making them the labor for the harvest, we could embrace the continual revival not only in the central church, but to each home. We spread the revival fire from our central church to each and every home. So they carry revival from each and every home. And my Christian members, they left Korea and they came back to America as immigrants. 
all the cell leaders. And without getting my permission, they start cell system in America. And among the Korean immigrants, they started more than 600 churches here in America. And they moved to the South America, and they started hundreds of churches there. So we are spreading the revival through lay Christian. They become the messenger of Jesus Christ, and they embrace the revival, and they go all over the world. So our revival is spreading throughout the country by training the lay Christian. One day, one young couple came to me and said, Pastor, we are leaving Seoul and we are going to Incheon, which will take about one hour drive. And uh, we are going to buy a home there and settle there. I said, okay, fine, you find a good fundamental church there and attend. He said, no, no. We want to open our home and we want to have a cell system. And then on Sunday, we will hire a bus and we will bring our cell members to your church. But I did not pay much attention to him. I said, okay, if you like, you do that. But after a few years, she came to me and said, Pastor, would you come to our area and have a meeting? I said, you know, I'm a busy person. I can't even go to Incheon to visit your family. I said, no, not my family. I said, I opened the home as you taught me, and we started a cell system. And we began to have a prayer meeting. I invited the neighboring people to our home, and we testified, and we taught, and we began to win one by one, and then we multiplied our cell system, and we have hundreds of cell systems. Now we have totally 3,000 people there, and we rented an auditorium. They have never seen directly our pastor, so we want to see our pastor. I said, 3,000, I'll go. <laughs> so I, when I went to Incheon, the auditorium was packed up just because of this young couple, without having any fanfare, very silently, they were touching their neighbors. And cell began to multiply, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. And all of these people were there. And those people who could come to church, they would come by bus, but otherwise they would only come to the cell. So I sent my associate pastor, and I let him start church there. Now he has 50,000 members there. It's a thriving church. It's sovereign, independent. It is very difficult to start church in Japan. Japan is a, is a tomb for the missionary. It's killing. Unbelief is terrible. Then God spoke into my heart, you go and start church in Japan. I said, Lord, I've been mostly holding meetings in Europe. I like to continue my ministry in Europe. I don't like to come to Japan. Because I was grown up under the Japanese occupation, and I all remember those atrocities that they carried out for the Korean people. And also, I have a great inferiority complex against them, so I dislike to go. I said, why don't you send my mother-in-law to their father? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was my uh, co-worker. I loved her, but I was being harassed by her very much. <laughs> When my mother-in-law comes to my home, I have argument with my wife. When she leaves, we have peace in our home. <laughs> but when she comes, she always agitates my wife. And so we would have argument. So I said, Father, why don't you send my mother-in-law to Japan? She's a good woman. She'll have a tremendous work there. But God said, no, no. He said, you start cell system in Japan, and you go there. So I prayed very much, and I chose one woman. 
She was also Mrs. Choi. Choi. She was uh, one of the associates in our church. And I said to her, she was not the best uh, the preacher, because best preacher I needed, I just chose a mediocre one in, among my uh, associates. You're the best one I need in my church. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 I told her, I said, you should go to Japan. And I only give you one-way ticket. <laughs> you become a kamikaze there. <laughs> if you can't plant church, don't come back home. <laughs> she was crying. She said, I'm not the person. Pastor, please choose another person. No, you are the one. <laughs> I said, you should go there. And you should start cell system. I said, don't try to hold a big campaign. Don't try to rent a big home, uh, the, the auditorium. Just uh, rent uh, your own house, open your house, and invite neighbors and start cell system through cell, Hunko, Japan. So I gave her one-way ticket. No more money. I said, by faith, you go and you pray. She went to Japan and downtown Tokyo. She rented a very small house, small room. And she began to fast and pray. She fast and prayed for 20 days. The landlord was scared. One Korean woman came and she would not eat. And she would fast and pray and she was uh, really pale and emaciated. And so they were afraid. So the landlord came. And they said, why don't you eat? We are afraid. You are going to die. She says, no, I'm Christian. I'm praying for the salvation of your soul. And by and by, they were one to Jesus Christ. Then by fasting and prayer, she began to pray for neighbors and visiting the neighbors and invited them to come to house. You know, people, they are afraid of coming to church, but they are not afraid of visiting the neighboring house. So one by one, they come. And she began to organize one cell, then two cell, three cell. She began to have dozens of cell. Then she sent me a notification, Pastor, come. We will rent a hall, and we will have meeting. So I flew to Tokyo, and when I went to the auditorium, she had around 100 people saved there. So we started church, and we began to penetrate Japan through cell system. Japanese people, they are addicted to television. They will not come to church. Every Japanese church has between 15 to 20 people. And pastors are suffering terribly. But we went through the cell system, and now, in Tokyo, we have two churches, which both of them have 5,000 members. 5,000 members. <laughs> and we started churches all over Japan. We have about 50 churches in, in Japan, all through cell system. You are the ministers, and I'm minister. And I tell you that if you really develop this cell system, you structure your church this way, then you can multiply your ministry through your lay Christian by the hundredfold. And many people come to me and say, wow, you have a magnificent church. I say, no, this is a cement building. We are only gathering together Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, all our prayer meetings to celebrate Jesus Christ. This is not our church. Our church is not here. Our church is in that apartment house, in that university, army bunker, and in marketplaces. Our churches are there. We are not in the building. We are outside the building. We are only coming to the building to receive education, encouragement, edification. But our churches are there, outside. I always say that to have a growing church, we have three types of ministry. Peter's ministry, 
James and John's ministry and Paul's ministry. This is uh, symbolic. Peter was called into ministry while he was casting the net. Many ministers, they are trying to fish human soul by the fishing rod, one by one. You can't fish too many souls. You must cast a net all over the city. You must cast a net over the town of the city and pull the net. Then you will have 100 people saved. And personally, individually, minister has no strength to do that. When you get organized, you are sell leaders into the big net. Get them organized from house to house, from town to town. You can make a big net of cell system. And you train the cell leader. You encourage them. You motivate them. And then they open their home. They don't need any specific uh, the, the auditorium. They open their home. Simply they invite their neighbors. And then without having any fear, they talk each other about Jesus. And when they come, they have coffee, even ashtray. Unbelievers, they come and smoke. So they have ashtray, but they talk about Jesus, and they ask all the questions, and, and the cell leaders answers and pray for them. Then by and by, they become born again Christian. They come to church, and they receive baptism, and they become normal members. So you need Peter's ministry. Very, very necessary. When you read the Acts, they were having service from house to house. And your house can be the sanctuary. And then you need James and John's ministry because James and John's were called into ministry while they were mending the broken net. Your cell system is going to be broken very often. Many of the cell leaders, they get discouraged and they would leave their ministry and they would move from another city and suddenly there appeared a broken net and the school of fish whoosh leave through that hole. So you need many associates, hundreds of associates. You divide them into the certain area and they should rush to fill the broken net. So James and John's ministry, they should mend the net. So I have 600 of my associates, they are all appointed to the area constantly and they are watching. They go there, encourage cell leaders, they build up cell leaders and teach them. And whenever cell leaders uh, fail and the broken net of fear, they fill in right away, then raise up another cell leaders. And this reason, my associates, they are very busy on the field. Every day, they go around and watch cell leaders. So our church ministry is done by the lay Christian, not by ministers. I always say to the ministers, you don't go and lead the cell. You encourage cell leaders to lead. Let the lay Christian build the church of Jesus Christ. So they are there to encourage cell leaders and train them and motivate them. At James and John's ministry, then I have the Paul's ministry. Paul was called into ministry while he was building the tent, church's tent. So when they bring the, all the fish to tent, I feed them. I'm, many people come to me and say, so you are terrifically busy. You have 700,000 people to take care of. You have 1,000 elders and 50,000 deacons. You think of that. All of those are sometimes thorn in my flesh. <laughs> you know? And they say, you be terribly busy with all the committee meetings. Then I should operate our daily newspaper. We have one million circulation every day. We have a powerful Christian newspaper. We are influencing government and whole society. And I did not start the newspaper because I liked, but they forced me to do that because unbelieving world began to attack me very fast ferociously. And uh, this uh, secular newspaper, news media began to attack our church and my personal life terribly. But I had no pulpit to speak to the world. I have a big campaign here and I can't come to Korea. I said, Billy, 
you believe that you can live by leaving Korea and go to America, I said, I'll accuse you to Jesus Christ. You are leaving me alone and you try to leave Korea to save your life. I said, you are cowardice. You must come back. But he says, I have a big campaign here. As campaign or no campaign, you made promise to stand with me together. You must come. Then, on Saturday, I called my parents. I said, Daddy, Mama, today I may go home because the sniper would shoot at me at any place. So if I go ahead, don't feel sorry. I go to heaven for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that day I went out to the plaza and 600,000 people gathered together. And oh, we prayed for our country. We interceded for our country all day long under the hot sun. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Then in the afternoon, at the time of dismissal of the meeting, the Spirit said, make a parade through the city. So I said, we are going to make parade through the town. Very dangerous. Snipers can be in any building and shoot at me. But God said, you stand in front and go. So I said, we are going to have parade. Then city police came and says, you are going to blockade the whole traffic and cause a chaos in the city. If you try to make parade without getting permission, we will put in you in jail. I said, all right, put us all together in jail, 600,000 people. <laughs> you don't have jail big enough to put us all in jail. We are parading. So we paraded. Then the students sent me notification. We, 3,000 of us are waiting here. We will destroy you. And so I said, okay, come. We, 600,000 of us are going to trample upon you. Come. <laughs> and no one came. They were scared by the vast crowd of Christians. We were carrying all the slogan and banners and all the television and live showed in the radio and newspaper, and we were parading through the town shouting, Jesus Christ. And next day, all things has settled down and very calm. We had a wonderful election without having any trouble. Then 1988, we had Summer Olympic, and again those things erupted. Then that time, I mobilized 700,000 people in the plaza, and we prayed again, interceded. Then we had wonderful, we had wonderful Summer Olympic. Through prayer, you can change your whole nation. You can change your politics. You can change your whole nation. There's a reason you should pray. Prayer. Bring God on the scene. God can only intervene in your personal affair through your prayer. And only through prayer you can touch others. The trouble right now in Christianity is a lack of sanctification. We have beautiful building, wonderful pastors, wonderful music and everything. But we lack the sanctification. Too much of the world came into the church. And especially leaders, they are compromising with the world too much. And the only way to be cleansed by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, is through prayer. By confessing our sin every day. Every day when I pray, I pray according to the tabernacle prayer. This is very powerful prayer, and I, I always uh, first come to tabernacle, and I come to the brazen altar, which is analogous to the Calvary. There I see Jesus, and I praise the blood of Jesus Christ. I wash the blood as Jesus through the blood. You cleansed our sin eternally. Through the blood, you made me righteous, so I worship the blood. Then I wash blood which brought us near to God and, and, uh, and reconciled us to Heavenly Father. I praise the blood which brings healing. I praise the blood for 
the, the, the redemption from the curse, and I praise the blood which conquered death and hell. So I start my prayer every day, worshiping the blood, looking to the cross, the brazen altar. I see my sacrifice, Jesus, sin offering, and uh, trespass offering, and peace offering, and burnt offering, my Jesus. And I worship him, I offer him, and I soak myself with blood. Then when I go to the labor, Lave is made out of the uh, bronze mirror. They beat the bronze mirror and made the, the, the water basin. So priests wash hands and face there before entering into the holy place. So they reflect themselves before the, the water basin. And when I go there, every morning I confess my sin. I reflect myself according to the Ten Commandments, according to the teaching of Jesus Christ, I say, dear Jesus, please forgive my unrighteousness. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. And you know, I have deep settled sin and I try to cleanse myself from the sin every day. That is a sin of exaggeration. You know, I'm pastor and I try to picture beautifully so that people could understand things really. That is my temptation. And so I say always, always my wife after preaching, she said, you exaggerate. Your number is exaggerated. Your story is exaggerated. And many times I got angry. I said, you go to pulpit and preach. <laughs> but she says, I'm telling the truth. So every day I confess my sin. I says, God, let me not tell a lie. This world is full of lies and I'm telling too much lie and I'm exaggerating too much. So please, please, oh God, forgive me. And now I'm far less exaggerating than before. <laughs> because I'm confessing my sin every day. I stand before the labor and I confess my sin of the, the, the telling the lie and exaggeration. Then I say, oh God, help me to totally allegiance to you. You are my Lord, I'm your hired servant. Let me just obey you. Then I always pray, oh God, make me sanctified. I may build a big church, I may organize a wonderful church, but if I lose sanctification, all the foundation is broken and destroyed. Brothers and sisters, nowadays we have wonderful preachers, wonderful church, but they lose ministry instantly because of the lack of the foundation, the sanctification. When we lose sanctification, we lose everything. So every day we should pray. There are no perfect person at all. And I'm praying every day. I say, God, protect me, cleanse me, sanctify me. In my mind, I'm now 63 years old. When I was younger, I was far more tempted. But now I'm less tempted because I'm getting older. I'm thinking about that. But still, I get temptation constantly in my mind. They will attack me, honestly. I'm always saying to my people, pray for me, I'm being tempted. And I say to my people, you young ladies, don't tempt me. I'm very weak, I'm very weak, I'm very weak. I, say, I always confess to you, I say, I'm very weak. I'm not strong man, I need your help, don't tempt me. You know, many of them, they are writing me, writing me a love letter and uh, they, are, they are trying to tempt me. When you have 700,000 people, they, you have many queer people there too. <laughs> so, I open up myself. I said, don't take your past as a super spiritual person. I'm very weak. When you tempt, I have danger of falling into temptation. So don't tempt me, you protect me. I protect you, you protect me. So I never travel alone. Many people accuse me because I am using chauffeur. I, use, I have driver's license, but I use my chauffeur so that my chauffeur could watch me. You know, wherever I go, my chauffeur drive me, so my chauffeur watch me. And I ask my wife to hire my chauffeur.
He reported everything to my wife where I went. You know, to protect myself. And when I travel in our country, outside the country, I go together with the dozens of Binesh people. We are checking together in hotel. We are leaving hotel together to protect me. Well, they become a hindrance to me, but still they become protection to me. <laughs> because since you are minister, I open my heart honestly to the lay Christian. I don't speak like this. But we are the ministers. We have holy calling. And we must protect ourselves. And uh, we are not Gibraltar. We are not strong. We are very weak vessel. So we should make all the arrangements to protect ourselves. So the temptation will not destroy our life and ministry. Right. So every day, every day we should ask God to sanctify us. And we should say, oh God, do not lead us into temptation and deliver us from the devil. Every day we should pray. We are very weak vessel. Then I ask God to cleanse me from the greed, from the avarice. When greed comes into me, then I would commit sin. Since I have the largest church in the world and we have abundance finance, our every year income amount to $150 million US. So we have good amount of the fund. And I have temptation. I want to have the best car. And all of my elders, you know, they try to tempt me. They say, you are a very important person. You should have the best car. And they say, you must live in the best home. And you must have a best life. Well, I think I'm entitled to. I've been in ministry for 40 years. I've suffered very much all these years. But still, I'm not using my privilege because if I start to do that, then unbelieving mass media would attack me. He said, look at his uh, personal life. And then I bring a shame upon Christianity. This reason I'm not using my privilege because I'm afraid. This unbelieving world is always watching at me and ready to attack me. And so I say, oh God, deliver me from the greed. Please deliver me from greed. You know, I really enjoy good clothes, good shoes, good food, and a good house. I'm born with that desire. But praise the Lord, my wife is not born with that desire. So she is always uh, uh, constrained me not to go into that direction. And so far I've been kept. So I'm praying every day, God, deliver me from the greed. Then also I pray that God deliver me from hatred. You know, when you have 1,000 elders and 50,000 deacons, many of them become a thorn in your flesh. And I don't like to hate them, but I hate them. You know, I hate many elders and I hate many deacons. They cause such a trouble. So every day I should ask God to forgive me. As God help me not to hate. Oh God, heal the spirit of hate. Give me a love. Give me a forgiving spirit. This is my trouble. I'm not saint. I'm struggling with people. And so far, God has helped me. Forgiveness has a tremendous power. One sister came to me. She was twitching her face. She was facial, uh, the, the, the paralysis. And she tried all the medicine, Chinese acupuncture, but she was not healed. I, I prayed for her many times, but she still was twitching. And she was a beautiful woman, but she messed up because of this paralysis. And one day she was crying. She said, I want to commit suicide. She says, I can't see myself in the mirror. And I was powerless. I laid hand on her and prayed many times, and nothing happened. Then the Holy Spirit said, ask her if she hates anybody. So I said, sister, do you hate anybody? She says, yes. I said, whom do you hate? In those. She says, we have big family. In the Orient, sometimes we have big family. She says, I live with father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and their family together. 
I work like a slave for my family, but they don't appreciate me. And they criticize me. So I hate my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law. I hate them. But I say, if you hate them, God will not answer to your prayer. You should love them. She cried. Pastor, I can't love them. If you were in my shoes, you would hate them also. He says, they don't appreciate me. I hate them. So I said, then I can't help you. Then the spirit checked me in the spirit. I said, why don't you counsel her according to the scripture? I said, I counsel with the scripture. Where does the Bible say that she should love her family before she got answer? My Bible says that forgive, not love. Forgive. Then your heavenly father shall forgive. So I said, sister, this is the teaching scripture. Forgive before you pray. Then Heavenly Father will forgive you. Can you forgive? She said, I can forgive. Okay. After forgiving, if you have some leftover power, then start love. <laughs> if you have no power left to love after forgiving, you're okay. So let's forgive. So we began to name the father, mother-in-law, and brother and sister-in-law. And she was uh, uh, naming, and she was confessing, and I was praying for her. And I opened my eyes to see what's go going to happen. And right in front of my eyes, her paralysis was, paralysis was disappearing. She was, uh, she was confessing the hatred, and she was confessing that, and healing power came, and twitching stopped, and she was healed. And as soon as I saw that, I right away knelt down. I said, oh, God, I forgive the elders. I forgive the deacons. I forgive the deaconess. <laughs> what a spiritual revival I felt. What a spiritual revival. Now I see that many people are not healed because they hate their sibling. Many people hate their father, mother, brothers and sisters and neighbors. And that hatred stopped the flowing of the healing power. And since finding out that I helped so many unhealed people to be healed by helping them to confess their hatred. So I pray, oh God, help me to love them. I should every day confess because uh, every day I get delivered. Then I fall into the trap again and again because I should deal with them personally. Then I say, oh God, make me meek and humble. Because when I come see people, my people, they come to my office to have counseling. When I see their hand, their hand tremble. They think me as a giant of the, uh, uh, the, the God's kingdom, something like a holy person. They are frightened about me. So when they come to have personal counseling, when I see they are trembling like this. So I said, oh God, I should never act ugly. I should be humble and meek so that nobody would feel intimidated in my presence. So I confess all of those kinds of things. Then I name the Ten Commandments one by one and mirror me there and I confess my sin. So every day I have tabernacle prayer. When I pray, I praise the blood of Jesus Christ, the praise and altar. Then I come to labor and I confess all of my sin and I ask God to sanctify me Sanctification is the foundation of my ministry. And if I lose my sanctification, next morning I lose my whole church, my whole ministry. Presently in Korea, one of the Korean Christian leaders, he is a Methodist, powerful person. When he was going to Bible college, he would attend my church and I pray for him. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I said in Methodism, if you preach Pentecostal message, you will have the largest Methodist church in the world. And he has now 80,000 members. And he's building a church which is larger than my church. And I'm happy about it. But he fell this time. He fell this time. And I'm believing mass media took it up and television broadcast it all over our country. Oh, miserable situation. And, and, and he's losing his ministry, he's losing his church, he's losing his, his Christians. He was uh, such a bright light. 
He was a shining star. But one morning, he lost his foundation. Now I'm trying to restore him. But I even myself feel miserable. Because when I try to restore him, unbelievers, they attack me also. They say, I should never, never restore him. He should die. But I love him so much. He's a wonderful preacher, powerful preacher. But now he lost his ministry. He built this ministry for 20 years. But he lost this ministry one morning by losing the sanctification. Just because of one woman, he's losing whole ministry. So, sanctification is very important. Brothers and sisters, we are the ministers. We are being attacked by Satan. We are fighting in front battle. And the many people get shot at in the, in, in the war. And so we are in the, in the battle. We are going to be shot at. So, sanctification is very necessary. Very necessary. I can't stress upon these things too, too much and too strong because uh, so many ministers under me, 3,000 ministers went out of my church. And so many of them fall in their ministry when they have about 1,000 people, 3,000 people, usually they fall and they lose whole foundation. I've seen over and over again through my 40 years of ministry. So we should watch out. Then I jog into the holy place. And when I see on the left side, I see the golden candlestick. This is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Then I go there and kneel down, and I, I really worship the Holy Spirit. I say, dear Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom. Impart me your wisdom. You are spirit of understanding, give me the understanding. You are spirit of counseling, give me good counseling. You are the spirit of power, give me the power of the Holy Spirit. You are the spirit of, of the fear of the Lord, put the fear of the Lord in my heart. You are spirit of the Holy God, give me the holy sanctification to me. Dear Holy Spirit, I worship you. You know, it is one thing to be born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and full of Holy Spirit and speaking other tongues. By this, another thing to have a personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He's a real person. So you must have a daily personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In 1964, God revealed that truth to me. Up until that time, I was satisfied with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but God said, he is a Holy person, you must have a very definite fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He says, this is the hour of the Holy Spirit. So you must have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And from that time until now, whenever I go to pulpit to speak, I always say, dear Holy Spirit, let's go. Even today, I said, dear Holy Spirit, let's go. Then the Holy Spirit said, change your message. If I preached my own message, I would have finished a long time ago. <laughs> so I always say, dear Holy Spirit, when I come to pray before the golden candlestick, I recognize you. I welcome you. I, I worship you. I thank you. Let's go together today. Let's go. And when I finish my sermon, I sit down, I say, Dear Holy Spirit, I really thank you. I messed up, but you corrected everything. I really thank you. The Holy Spirit, I have fellowship. How do you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit? You must talk to each other. If you don't talk, you can't have fellowship. Once I was lecturing uh, to the Billy Graham's team and one Baptist pastor. He said, Joe, stop, stop. I see the red light. You cannot talk to the Holy Spirit. So I said, brother, 
Father, God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. It's, uh, and we, we are all family members. We are family members. We are talk to each other freely. We not only talk to father, but we talk to the mother and son and children. You know, if you neglect the Holy Spirit, he is going to be quenched. So he's a person. Person need to be praised, loved, and encouraged. I got married when I was 29 years old. But at that time, I wanted to become a Billy Graham of Korea. So I would leave my wife in the apartment. Monday, I leave for evangelistic field. And Saturday, I come with a lot of laundry. After Sunday service, then I would leave again. Korean women, they are, they are very, how shall I say, obedient to the husband. This oriental custom. Now they are changed because of American television. <laughs> And uh, she would cook a delicious meal and uh, fill the, 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 the wash tub with the warm water. And she was doing everything for me. Then after a little while, she was depressed. She was crying. And one day, my mother-in-law came to me and said, son, I want to talk with you. She said, your wife is going to leave you. She said, how come? She said, you didn't bring a thing to your home. You brought a person to your home and you are a neglecting person, and her spirit is quenched, and she's going to leave you. I said, oh, mother, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So I went home. I called my wife and said, you are a grown-up woman. You are married to me. You married a preacher. When you have trouble, you are not supposed to go to your mother-in-law, you your mother, like a baby. You must talk with me. You are full of devil. I, I can solve this problem. So I laid a hand on her. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you whining devil, come out. You whining devil, go out. And I said, problem solved. But brother and sister, it's got worse. She was really depressed now. And she would not even rise up in the morning. And I was in terrible situation. So I really begin to pray, God, I want to become a Korean Billy Graham, and I need to go out to the evangelistic field. And she's becoming a hindrance. You must help me to solve this problem. Then God spoke to my heart. I don't need any other Billy Graham anymore. <laughs> you are Cho. You are not Billy Graham. Be a Cho. Don't imitate Billy Graham. I didn't call you as evangelist. I called you as a pastor. Very definite. Then God said, don't neglect your wife. Listen to her. You may build a good church, tremendous church. You may become a tremendous evangelist. But if you get divorced, you lose everything next morning. You lose everything. So God said, do this way. In my heart, the spirit of the Lord revealing is God's God first, you second, and your wife third, and your children fourth, your church fifth. I said, no way. This is spirit from America, not from Korea. <laughs> I said, I can't accept that. I said, I said, God first, church second, and me third, children fourth, my wife fifth. And God said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, God first, then if you don't take good care of God's servant, you can't serve unto the Lord. Take good care of yourself. Then your wife. Then your children. Then your church. I really had struggle in my mind. I could not accept that. But finally, I settled down, so I went to my wife. I said, every Monday, I give my time to you. You do anything you like with me. So every Monday, she would pack up sandwich, and she wanted me to go to the park and walk miles and miles, hand in hand together. 
it was no easy thing at all. Because my mind was in evangelistic field, and she is talking and talking and talking. And then always she wants to confirm about, do you hear what I say? What did I say? What? What did you say? <laughs> oh, brother, I had a forced fellowship with her. Then she would go to the window shopping, and my backbone was broken. I said, I'll give you money, pick up anything. She said, I enjoy window shopping. Today you gave whole day to me, so you must window shop together with me. <laughs> month after month, I had a forced fellowship. She was restored. She restored her health. I found one thing, that she was person, not a thing. Person need to be cared, loved, adored, and fellowshiped. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is a person. He is not a thing. He has been with you since you were saved. You must adore him. You must thank him, recognize him. Nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm 63 and my wife is 57. And she's uh, pleasantly plump. <laughs> and uh, don't send this tape to my wife. <laughs> But every day, every day I say, honey, you look so wonderful. You are so beautiful. Some, some are true, some are lie. <laughs> but I tell you, brothers and sisters, she is a person. I should build her personality and her pride. And so I've been living with her for 33 years. I have gained more wisdom now. And I don't know in America, but in Orient, women, when they get older, they become lioness, very strong and powerful. In, in Orient, women carry all the money. When we make money, we should give all the money to the woman, wife. I've never seen my salary envelope yet, because it directly goes to my wife. That is reason Korean church has a lot of money, because we have more women than men in church, and women more easily listen to the voice of Holy Spirit, and they save money and give more money to church. Men are stingy, so they don't give too much money to the Lord. So, women, in Korea, women have money, I tell you. Husband, they make money and give all women, and every day, husband should beg money from women. <laughs> <laughs> I should always beg my wife, I say, honey, today I need $20. She says, where are you going to spend $20? <laughs> you see, I, sh I should eat the lunch, I should meet my friend, and I should go to swimming pool, and so you must give me $20. She says, just spend $15. Oh, no, please, please give me. This is Korea. And when I came to Europe and America and told this story, they said, oh, that's heretic. We are not doing that. When we make money, that's our money. But in Korea, I wish those days would come sooner. So when I have special income, I should hide the special income in some place. <laughs> so always, always, I should encourage and recognize and, and, and praise my wife. She's a person. And men also need a praise from the wives. You, you wives of the ministers, you please give abundant praise to your 
husband, he's preaching. You know, when I preach in my church, after the service, I feel so empty. I feel as if I were rung up red. I become so tired, so empty. I need a praise. So when I come back home, I follow after my wife from the living room to the kitchen, <laughs> expecting some praise about my sermon. <laughs> but for a long time, she has been so stingy. She will not praise me at all. And so finally, I, s I, I sat down with her. I said, honey, I need your praise. Honestly, I feel so tired, so empty. I don't even feel like preaching next week. I preached everything. I have no material. I need your encouragement. I need some of your praise. She looked at me and said, you are becoming arrogant now. <laughs> she said, so many people are praising you. And why should I praise you? I said, honey, praises from other people are like a chewing gum. I should chew and spit. If I drink that stick into my stomach and cause trouble. When you praise me, I eat. That become nutrition to my spirit. When, when other people praise, that is a chewing gum. You should never eat it, spit it out. You must praise for me. In other words, I can't stand this stress. I feel so empty. So she laughed. From that time on, she really praised me. Oh, you preached a wonderful message. <laughs> wonderful message. <laughs> and I know that I forced her to praise me, but still I enjoy her praise. <laughs> so you ladies, I really pray with you. Praise your husband. They need your praise. They need your encouragement. Nobody can give that praise to your husband. So, we are all person. We are created according to the God's image and likeness. And God needs praise. Don't we praise God always? God needs praise. Always. We also need praise because we are in God's image and likeness. So praise your wife. Praise your husband. Build them each other. And the Holy Spirit is a person. So we always should say, when we come, when you pray the prayer of tabernacle, you come to the golden candlestick. You say, Dear Holy Spirit, I recognize you. I welcome you. I thank you. I adore you. You have been always working through me. I thank you very much, dear Holy Spirit. Let's go together. Let's go. When I started to recognize the Holy Spirit, I started to feel the, another dimension of power falling upon my ministry. So, you must have fellowship and you should have partnership with the Holy Spirit. He is a senior partner, you are the junior. He is the Lord of the harvest, you are his hired servant. So always, always discuss with the Holy Spirit. Before spirits speak, don't move. You know, work of the Holy Spirit is, 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 is activity. You are in the place of receptivity. Our role is not activity. We are in the place of receptivity. The Holy Spirit act and we receive. So do never go ahead of the Holy Spirit. Wait upon the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't speak, just wait. When he speaks, then move. So you should have a fellowship and partnership with the Holy Spirit. There I worship the Holy Spirit in my prayer very much. Then when I look at the far right corner, there I see the showbread. Showbread is the word of Jesus Christ. I said, oh, Lord, I thank you this bread. I thank you the word of God. I thank you the Logos because I receive all the information about God and kingdom of God through Bible. But God, please give me the rhema every day. Rhema is a word of God for the specific person at a specific time. And if we... By studying the Logos, we give the information about the kingdom of God to the people. But by Rhema, they gain faith. Faith comes by hearing. So if you don't preach Rhema, people do not catch faith to, hold, to, to solve the problem. This reason, my, I'm desperate to receive Rhema from the Lord. Wednesday, I have a Bible study. But Sunday, 
I've got to have word of God directly from him. Not written word, but spoken word. I want to hear his word. I go into prayer, prayer grotto and I wait before the Lord. God, speak out of the Bible. Speak through the Holy Spirit. I should have a spoken word instead of written word. Then when I make message out of the that's a rhema, then I can really impart the faith into the heart of people. They receive the word, they believe, and they are encouraged. And God gave me a rhema whenever I pray for the healing. I had one of the greatest miracles one day in my life. A woman was terribly suffering. She was sitting right in front of the seat, and the people were helping her. She was suffering during service. And I didn't know what happened. Later, I found out that uh, she was pregnant and the baby died. And she, uh, the baby was decaying in the womb. So doctor said that if she would not op be operated right away, then the poison would uh, uh, destroy the mother. But uh, our cell leader brought her to the church. And while she was listening to my sermon, she was dying there. She was under excruciating pain. But while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit said to me, don't finish your preaching. Some woman is dying with a dead fetus in her womb. You announce divine healing. In the middle of my sermon, I usually do not stop my preaching, but I said, sorry people, some woman here has a dead fetus in her womb, and she is also dying, being poisoned. And I tell you in the name of Jesus Christ, God is quickening that dead fetus, and things are going to be all right. Then I continued my sermon, and I forgot all the story. And a few months ago, on Sunday, a lady brought an 18-year-old young girl. And she says, Pastor, I want to testify before people. I said, what do you like to testify? That Sunday, 18 years ago, I was dying with dead fetus in my womb. And I was having an excruciating pain. Then suddenly you stopped your preaching. You said, some woman here is dying with dead fetus in the womb. And she said, I was that woman. Instantly, I was quickened. And I went back to hospital. And uh, they x-rayed. And the fetus came alive. This is my girl there. She's 18 years old. You know, if I had not listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit, her child and she would have died. So we must have the ear to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Since I operate the newspaper, I receive news from all over the world. And I once received a very interesting news. Some of the African brethren, they got together and they had a prayer meeting. And then they said, well, Jesus Christ and Peter walked on the water. We have the same Jesus. Why don't we walk on the water? So they studied the Bible, they were uh, emboldened by the scripture, so they took the boat and they rode into the middle, deep middle part of the lake. Ten of them jumped out of the boat and all were drowned. That came as a news to a newspaper company. And the reporters came to me, they said, how come? They believed the word, but they were all drowned and they dead, died. I said, this is news. And I said, Pastor, you always ask us to believe God. How come? They believe. So I said, you have a great misunderstanding. They, they stood up on the logos. God never spoke them to come out of the boat. God commanded Peter to come out of the boat. He had a rhema. They are direct word from the Lord. But they had logos. They only studied the Bible. So they did not receive faith. So they were drowned. That's the difference. You know, even in divine healing, many diabetics, I do never ask diabetics not to take insulin. I say, pray till you listen, hear from the Lord. When the Lord speaks to your heart to stop receiving the insulin, 
Then start believing. But don't stand on the written word. The written word is given to everybody under heaven. This is potential blessing of God, not practical blessing of God. But when you pray very much, then the Spirit will turn this logos into the rhema to you. Then that scripture belongs to you. You may risk your life on it. So brothers and sisters, we should pray very much till the Spirit speaks into our heart. So I pray always when I come to showbread, thank you for logos. But please give my daily rhema. Please give me your word directly to me so that I may launch out by faith. Then I come to the middle part of the altar. There's incense altar. There uh, the priest burn incense every day to the Lord. There I give all the praise to the Heavenly Father. I praise the Heavenly Father. He's a God in heaven and on earth, and he is almighty, omniscient, and omnipresent. And I praise his name. Then I go through the curtain. I go to the Holy of Holy. Then I see the... the Ark of Covenant, and I see the, the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. There I worship God. I am now in Holy of Holy. So I say, oh God, I worship this blood. This blood took away all the sin, brought the righteousness of God in my life. And this blood destroyed the kingdom of devil, disarmed. And this blood canceled the law and condemnation. And this blood assures me that by faith, in the grace of Jesus Christ, I become righteous and saved. So I praise God. I'm saved through faith in Jesus Christ. There I worship God. Since I am now directly in the presence of God, there now I begin to pray all of my need. So I call this uh, 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 tabernacle prayer. I was lecturing to the uh, Taiwanese pastors and about prayer. And instantly, in a split second, God opened my mind, and God said, pray according to tabernacle prayer. In Old Testament, Israelites, they were all commanded to come to tabernacle to pray. They were not permitted to go to any other place, but to tabernacle to pray. He said, all of those things are symbolic to the New Testament Christian, shadow to New Testament Christian. It's, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the tabernacle. You don't need to go to any other places. But through you, you must pray according to the tabernacle. So I am tabernacle now. So in my heart, in my thoughts, I come to the brazen altar, the cross of Jesus Christ. There I worship the blood. In my heart, I come to the labor and I confess all of my sins. So in my heart, I come to the holy place, golden candlestick, worship the Holy Spirit, I worship the showbread, I worship God, then in my heart I enter into the holy of holy place and I worship my Heavenly Father. Because your spirit is analogous to the holy of holy. Your mind is analogous to the holy place and your physical body is analogous to the courtyard. And so God is dwelling in your spirit. And you, why do you come to this seminar? To renew your mind, holy place. You can't do anything about your holy of holy, your spirit. You are born again, the Holy Spirit in the world there. But you are here to renew the holy place, your mind. The Holy Spirit, your spirit come through your mind, through your courtyard, and go to the people. So when the spirit want to move out of your spirit, but when your mind is not renewed, your mind blockade by disobedience and sanctification and by uh, love of faith. You blockade the power of the Holy Spirit in holy places. The Holy Spirit wants to flow through the, from holy of holy through the holy place. And the holy place, your mind should be renewed. Bible says, iron sharpens iron. So we are sharpening each other. You know? Tonight I'm sharpening you and you sharpening me. So we are renewing our mind, holy place. Then the Holy Spirit freely flow through the Holy, Holy, your spirit, through your mind, through your physical body, and minister to the people. Don't think that God is a million miles away. Bible says, don't say the kingdom of God is here and there. The kingdom of God is in you. 
since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, kingdom of God has come into your own heart. Your spirit is the holy of holy. Your mind is holy place. Your body is courtyard. And so you must be very careful. You are the kingdom of God. I always say to my Christian, you are the mini kingdom of God. So when you go back home, you take bus, you say to yourself, the kingdom of God is taking the bus. <laughs> and when you come home, you should say, the kingdom of God has arrived at home. We are the kingdom of God. Yeah. So, when we pray, we pray according to the tabernacle. So, I, I praise God before the, uh, uh, the, 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 the incense altar. Then I enter into the holy place. Then I see the covenant, Ark of Covenant, see the blood, Jesus, and worship the blood. Since I come to the direct presence of God, I can offer all other prayer there. So every day I pray according to this tabernacle prayer. And this is so powerful. To pray thoroughly according to this uh, tabernacle prayer, it takes at least 30 minutes to one hour. And uh, I call this uh, prayer jogging course. When you jog, you always decide the course. 10 minutes jogging, 30 minutes jogging, one hour jogging. So in my personal life, I've developed many prayer jogging course. I have 15 minutes jogging course, 30 minutes to one hour jogging course, this tabernacle prayer. I have more than one hour jogging course, the Lord's Prayer. Then I have a marathon course also. God has developed this prayer course, and I use this prayer course. Otherwise, you can pray every day more than three, 30 to one hour. You become tedious, and you, you, you can't pray. But when you decide this jogging course of prayer, you pray same course, and your prayer becomes very powerful. My prayer life becomes so powerful because I pray every day according to tabernacle prayer. I come to the brazen altar and I worship blood. All of our prayers should start from the blood, blood of Jesus Christ. So I worship blood abundantly. Then I come to the labor and I confess all of my sin. Every day I confess all of my sin, cleanse myself. Then I enter the holy place. I worship the Holy Spirit. I have fellowship. I have deep, deep fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Then I go and praise the word of God and ask God to give me a rhema. Then I worship God at the intense altar. Then I enter into the Holy of Holy through the broken body of Jesus Christ. Then I worship the blood, covenant. And then I pray for my family, for my church and everything. And God answers me. I always feel the tingling presence of Holy Spirit when I finish the tabernacle prayer. And brothers and sisters, practice this tabernacle prayer. This will help and enhance your prayer life 100%, tremendously. I always practice this uh, tabernacle prayer. And this helps me so much. Well, I think I should conclude my message now. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry that I could not carry out my planned message. I had more academic, well-planned, wonderful message, but God just changed the whole program. And, but, Praise the Holy Spirit. God bless you.